Psalm 40 is where we are tonight. So if you, if you happen to close your Bible, I'm sorry. Let's get, let's get back to Psalm 40, and, um, and we'll, we'll look through it together tonight. As we talk about being sustained by the Master, sustained by the Master. One of the most popular verses out of this psalm uh, is, is verse 4. And verse 4 sets, kind of sets the tone for the chapter in a lot of ways. It says, how blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. And really the question that to me, in, in my mind this week as I was preparing that naturally follows this, the question that came up for me was, well, then how? How is such a man blessed? How is someone who trusts in the Lord and makes the Lord his trust? How is such a person blessed? And I'm convinced that we can see together here from this passage tonight, two distinct blessings that God gives us. So if I could put the message to, together tonight into one sentence, it would be this. God blesses those who trust in him with a testimony of his faithfulness in the past and a sure hope of his faithfulness for the present and future. Let me say that one more time. God blesses those who trusted, who trust in him with a testimony of his faithfulness in the past and a sure hope of his faithfulness for the present and future. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is a lamp into our feet. It's a light into our path. So, Lord, as we study your word now, would you hide your word in our heart that we may not sin against you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what I want to do is I want to take that main, that main idea I want to break it into two pieces, and we'll take it apart and see, see what we can see. First of all, I want, to, I want us to think about this. First, God blesses those who trust in him with a testimony from the past. With a testimony from the past. I, I think it's so amazing that uh, whether it's the, the song for the offering tonight, whether it's Pastor Cody's message this morning about witnesses, testimony, all that fits in together with this, with this section here. As the psalm begins, David is looking back on his past. And, you, and he sees a testimony. He sees a continuing thread of God's faithfulness woven throughout all of his past. And first, you could say maybe if you're taking notes tonight, this would be like 1A. You know, for the note takers. Um, he remembers how God delivered him from destruction. He remembers how God delivered him from destruction. Look at verse one. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. Like Pastor Cody said this morning, we serve a living God. Amen. And not just a God who lives. Because, you know, some people believe that they have a living God, but that he's like the great watchmaker, that he fashioned the world in all the universe, and he wound it up like a watch, and he just let it go to do whatever it will according to the rules that he set. And that's not the God of the Bible. Because we have a living God who hears us. Right? He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me. He heard my cry. And David tells us not only did he hear, but he responded. He did something when we cried to him. Look at verse two. He, he says, he brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. And he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. And we don't know all the details here, right? But what we do know is that God had saved him from danger, had set him in a place of security, and had stirred up his heart to worship. And then gave him a song to express that worship through. I love that. Um, I, I write songs every now and then. And so for me, I, when, I, when I think about writing songs, like the, the process is never the same. I admire the people that just, they, they, oh, yeah, I sit down and I, I think about this for about five minutes and I do this for about, I'm like, no, it's one, one can take an hour. One has, one, one has been, I've been working on for 10 years. And it's still not quite the way that I want it. So when he says, and he 
He put a, a new song in my mouth. Like, man, that's awesome. And I want you to listen how his heart bursts forth in praise as he remembers God's faithfulness. Verse 4. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare to you. If I were to declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Remembering God's faithfulness should lead us to worship. Adrian Rogers used to say that no matter what you were before you came to know Christ, in Christ you become a singer. You think about that. When you think about the, the mercy that he's shown you, the grace that he's poured out upon you, to think about where you would be apart from Christ. There's something about that that should drive our soul and our hearts and our mouths to proclaim his goodness. And if you're having trouble, if you're having trouble remembering how God's been faithful to you, my suggestion is start with the gospel. Start with the gospel. Remember the gospel that God created you and I to know and enjoy him above all things. But we rebelled against him and rightly deserve his wrath as his enemies. But God, in his great love for us, he gave us his son, Jesus. Jesus Christ, the God-man. Jesus bore the wrath that should have been ours on the cross. And he demonstrated his power over death in raising him again on the third day. So that then you, when you, if you, turn from your sin and are trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and master over your life, you have been translated out of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light. You are no longer, no longer under the sentence of a, of a Christless eternity where you bear this wrath, this burning wrath that waits for those who do not know Jesus. That's not you anymore. Why? Because in Christ, God has reconciled you to himself forever. So if you ever have trouble remembering how God has been faithful to you, start with the gospel. And I have a feeling that that ought to get your motor running. And it's not because of anything you or I have done. Not even because of the fact that we're trusting. Right? Many people trust in lots of things. In fact, I... One of, I mean, I grew up in the South, and I mean, there was, there's, I've heard a lot of times, well, he, you know, just, he's sincere, but he's sincerely wrong. So it's not even in the fact that we're trusting, it's who we're trusting in. And notice that, you can see that there in, in verse 4. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust, and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse in falsehood. So before we continue, I need to ask you this question. Is the Lord your trust? Have you turned from sin? And are you trusting? Not just that you made a decision back then. But now, are you trusting in Jesus Christ? The Jesus Christ of the Bible as Lord and master over your life. And if you're not, my prayer is tonight that God would call you to himself and that you would respond in repentance and faith. Because I need to be honest with you. Sometimes when we hear preaching, we can get a little confused because we hear maybe about a blessing or a promise that's given. And we, and we don't stop and think about who that blessing or who that promise is addressed to friends every blessing we're talking about in this passage tonight is for those who trust in jesus and i never want and i know pastor cody doesn't want either for you to ever think that a that a blessing or a promise is promised to you that the bible doesn't promise 
All of this is only found in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so please know that this is, this is through Christ. And my prayer is that you would trust in him. Not only did David remember how God had delivered him from destruction, this would be the one B if you're keeping notes. God had delivered him from vain religion. Look at verse 6. He says, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. The Lord had taught David that not all methods of worship are right and true. And again, that you could be sincere, but you could be sincerely wrong. See, David was aware of the failure of his predecessor, King Saul. Remember King Saul? He stood head and shoulders taller than everyone else. Everyone was really proud of him. Why? Because he looked like a king. He was the king that the people wanted, but he wasn't the king that people needed. So if you think back in 1 Samuel 15, Saul had commanded, or Saul was commanded by the Lord to destroy the Amalekites. And all they had, But when Samuel, the prophet, arrives, he says to Saul, why do I hear the sound of sheep and cattle? You were supposed to destroy everything. So why do I hear livestock? You see, what Saul had done was Saul decided to spare the king, Agag, of the Amalekites. I mean, that, I mean, these things should have been on the, on, the, on the name list for you guys, right? Agag, Amalek, you know. No, Emmett's a great name. <coughs> so he spares King Agag, and he spares the best of the animals. And, and I love, I think it's very telling that the scripture notes that the things they didn't want, they destroyed. But the best things, they kept. And so Samuel asks him why, and he says, well, I I kept these things for worship. We were going to sacrifice the best to God. And this is what the Lord tells tells Saul through the prophet Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 22. See if this sounds familiar, considering everything we've been talking about in Zechariah over the last couple of weeks on Wednesday nights. The Lord says this, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Listen now to David's response back in our passage, Psalm 40. How David responds to the Lord's teaching, because he says, you've opened my ear, right? You're teaching me. In Psalm 40, verse 7, verse 7, it says, then I said, behold, I come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. Verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. When it comes to worship and serving God, David learned the value of doing it by the book. Not just in, in, in ceremony, but in his life. He had a valuable object lesson by seeing the life of King Saul. And that this is what a king doesn't do. And according to what God's words, uh, by doing the, he learned to do things by what God's word says. And just like Pastor Cody said on Wednesday nights, we have to reject this notion that coming to church and worshiping the Lord excuses our devotion to him for the rest of the week. It's so easy to be here in this place with these people and to worship and, I mean, to sing, to close our eyes and even raise our hands and to think we're doing this right. What about tomorrow morning? When it's just us and no one else sees. God isn't interested in our worship if it's empty. He he gets no glory from that. Why? Because he sees our hearts. The next chapter over in 1 Samuel. 
we see is clearly as God has rejected Saul as king, he's sending Samuel out to find the, the new king. And all of, all of David's brothers pass before Samuel. And he thinks, wow, surely this is the one. And the Lord says, no, I've rejected him. Because man, because man, you look at what you can see. But the Lord looks upon the heart. What gives God glory is a changed heart. One that seeks to love God with obedience by faith. And why by faith? Because there's no way. There's no way that we can rightly obey on our own. We need the Spirit of God directing and empowering us to obey His Word. So, remember our main question for tonight. How is, how is the man who trusts in the Lord blessed? First, we saw God blesses them with a testimony from the past. Second, God blesses them with a sure hope for the present and future. Again, a hope of what? A sure hope of what? Of God's faithfulness. Let's look at verse 11. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. In the present, Dan, David is standing firm on the truth of God's word. And in addition to that, he has a personal testimony. Not replacing God's word, but coming alongside as a further encouragement. A personal testimony of God's faithfulness in his own life. How he delivered him from destruction and from vain religion. And in the present, those things are now the foundation under David's feet as he steps out in faith, trusting God with his present needs. And I want you to see what David doesn't say here in verse 11. What he doesn't say is, you, O Lord, might not withhold your compassion. Lord, I'm almost sure you won't withhold it from me. No, what does he say? You will not withhold it. Your loving kindness and your truth will. And listen to this, continually, right? Not just sometimes here and sometimes not, right? But will continually preserve me. Now back in now at verse 12, the psalm almost like a movie camera begins to pan back. See, up until now we've really just seen David and his thoughts. David as he is thinking back on his past. And now we begin to pan back and we see his context. We see what's going on around him. We see the setting. And I love this because what we get to see now is we get to see the, we have the blessing of seeing a believer living out his life, trusting the Lord, not in a vacuum, not in some laboratory somewhere, but in real life. Right? Sometimes we can talk a lot about the Lord, but only in like this laboratory not having any contact with the outside world kind of way, right? Right here, we see David is struggling. And so this, these memories, this testimony has a purpose in the now. So let's, let's look at that, all right? So he has two different needs. Two different things are pressing him at the same time. First, he needs deliverance from personal sin. He needs deliverance from personal sin. Look at verse 12. For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs on my head. And my heart has failed me. David is in trouble and he knows it. He has no confusion about his power alone against sin. He has none. He has no power against sin on his own. Friends, we would do well to listen to David's words. He is giving us a window into your fight with sin and my fight with sin apart from faith in the indwelling power of the Spirit of God. Friend, you don't have what it takes. It's encouragement time at the house of the Lord. You don't have what it takes. You can't do it by yourself. You and I need Jesus. How dare we ever think that we could stand up against temptation to sin on our own? We can't. You, you want proof that that doesn't work? Think about your life before Christ. How did that go? Not too great, right? Absolutely. You aren't strong enough to fight off sin. After all, our hearts are bent toward sinning. We are not just people who happen to sin occasionally, we are sinful people. 
So obviously, this confident hope that David has isn't in himself. It's not about his ability to pull himself up by his bootstraps and just kick sin out of the picture. No, it's in God and what God alone can do. Not only did David need deliverance from personal sin, so that's one situation. He needs not only that, he needs deliverance from evil persons, from sinful persons. Deliverance from personal sin and deliverance from sinful persons. Look at verses 14 and 15. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. I loved hearing Cody say that. Aha, aha. It's... Yet again, David is facing real danger from evil people who live to see his downfall. You ever been around somebody like that? It just seems like you, you can't breathe wrong because they're waiting. That's fun, you know. But I want you to see this. Even as David is seeking justice, he does so not, not by trying to get it on his own. He's not trying to take matters into his own hands. What's he doing? He is trusting that God will be the one who deals out justice. David is so confident in God's power and in God's character. Not only that he will bring justice, but that he'll do it in the right way. In a better way than he is able to give. That he sets his hope upon God to sustain him. I want you to see that. He's so confident in God's power and God's character that he sets his hope. Right? Not just like, I hope that, you know, Jacksonville has a good team next year. Right? That's not, that's not a sure hope. We could say that about any team. I'm not just picking on Jacksonville, right? Every year is a toss-up. No matter what sport, it's a toss-up. That's not the kind of hope we're talking about here. David sets a sure hope on God. That God will be the one who avenges him. And you see it here. You see it not just here, but other places in the same psalm. He says it in verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. He is, he is confident that the Lord will do this. To the degree that the Lord is his only hope. Verse 17, David says, since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. So he has set his hope, not on himself, not on a situation around him, not just hoping that people will go away and start minding their own business, but he's setting his hope on God. The other night I was walking around the house with my seven-month-old, Jubilee, trying to get her to sleep. I'd, I'd tried everything I could think of. I'd done the best, and if you're a parent, you understand this. I tried my best sleep moves. You know what I'm talking about? The rocking, bouncing, and maybe I'm maybe I'm not walking right. Maybe you know you can get you can get into some really hot, fine tuned m- movements, and maybe I I don't know. I tried everything I could think of. I had done my best, and she wasn't getting with the program. And to be honest, in that moment, I started getting frustrated with her. And in that moment. The Lord convicted me. I want to I want to parent my children with excellence, and I should. But my hope can't be in the way that I put my children to sleep. And that's exactly what I was trying to do. Instead, my hope needs to be in the Lord, whom the Bible says gives his beloved sleep. That's a great verse to claim. For my child and for me at that moment, oh Lord, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to sleep at some point. I'm 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 claiming that promise, Lord. So I confessed that to the Lord there in the quietness of my heart as I held my daughter. And it was the funniest thing. Within, within a minute, she was asleep. Now, does that mean that's my new technique for getting Jubilee to, to, to go to sleep? No, no, no. Please understand, no. I'm not trying to give parenting tips up here. As, as the next night was very clear, right? 
That did not work, right? But I do believe, I genuinely believe, I'm convinced that, the, that in that night, the Lord allowed that to happen in that way to show me that even in something as trivial and every day as putting my child to bed, that I can put my hope in the wrong thing. Friends, created things, people, items, sports teams, your spouse, your children, they were not created to carry your hope. And it's amazing how what I get frustrated with, or sometimes just plum angry, right? It's amazing how my frustration will show the things that I'm trying to force my hope on in my life. So friends, what are you getting frustrated with? Could it be that you're putting your hope in the wrong place? May we repent and place our hope where it's designed to go. On his shoulders. And I love that not only was David's hope for the present, but it was for the future. It was not just to get out of danger, but it was for something so much greater, that God would be glorified. Look at this. Verse 3. We'll we'll skip around the chapter, but verse 3. David says, many will see and fear and will trust the Lord. Notice, I'm going to get English teachery here for a second. What tense is that? Future tense, right? Many will. He is claiming something that has not happened yet. He is sure. We don't tend to use the word will unless we're sure about something. Right? Many will see and fear and and will trust the Lord. Then he, he even worked fervently to see that happen in verse 10. Verse 10 says, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. Didn't keep it under a basket. Right? But I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation, the great assembly, the church. And he's dependent on God to produce it in verse 16. I want you to see that. Verse 16. Let all those who who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. How is it possible for that all to be present at the same time? How, How is that possible that he is... He is sure that it's going to happen. He's working to make it happen. And he's dependent on God to produce it. It seems, seems kind of schizophrenic in a way, right? It's because his hope is in God. Yet God has commanded him to declare his righteousness. It, I, I love that about God. that he, Because God promises in his word that he will be glorified like this. At the same time, it, it commands, God's word commands that we work toward that end, knowing that when it happens, it was only because God produced it. So you work hard all day and you sleep well at night, knowing that it's, in all, when all things are considered, it's not about what we've done. It's about what he has done through us. David's life here shows us a picture of someone who is leaning so heavily, resting so completely on the Lord that if, for some reason, now I'm saying if, please hear that, right? I'm not, Justin's not doubting the Lord's purposes here, okay? But that if, for some reason, God didn't come through for David, David's life would collapse like a house of cards. Friends, is that your life? Is it mine? Are we trusting the Lord to such a degree that the world sees it as ridiculous? foolish even if the world doesn't see our lives that way then here are two questions one are we really trusting christ and two maybe you are trusting christ then are you truly engaging the lost people around you are you inviting them into your life so one are you trusting in christ truly and two are you inviting people into your life Because if those two things are true, you're going to have people in your life that think that your life is ridiculous. So, 
Who remembers our main idea from tonight? God blesses those who trust in him with a testimony of his faithfulness in the past and a sure hope of his faithfulness for the present and the future. And I want to close with just with two, two questions, two more questions I'd like to ask you. One, as we think about how David's, David, the purpose, what was the purpose for that testimony in his life? He recalled God's faithfulness in a time that he needed to trust God's faithfulness. In a time where his, where his faith was being tested, what did he do? He went back to what he knew. He went back to the word and how he had seen God work in his life. So my two questions are this. One, are you taking time to regularly think back on the past day, week, month, whatever, whatever period of time you choose? But are you regularly taking time to think back on, on what's happened and reflect on God's faithfulness? Maybe even write it down. Two, in your recent or current needs and struggles, how much, to what degree is God's word and his testimony in you serving as a foundation for your faith now? All those times, all those things that have happened before where you've seen God working faithfully in your life, they are a gift to you right now. Why? Because you can see, look back and see how his hand was at work and how you would be a fool not to trust him now. And the more that we do that, the more assurance grows. And the more we tend to lean back on him. And the more, our, the more ridiculous our lives are going to look to the world, which is totally okay because it doesn't matter what they think anyway. Let's pray together.